We are in week two of a series we began last week called One Another, One Another. And this is a relational series, and it's relational in the fact that it has to do with how we relate to one another. And uh, what we have, we have an interesting dynamic in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. Because if you remember back on the day of Pentecost, the gospel goes to the Jewish people. All the Jewish people from all, from Jerusalem and all the surrounding nations were gathered together and they heard the gospel, they received the gospel, and they became part of the church. But the church didn't stop right there in Jerusalem. It spread to other nations. Uh, And it spread to Philippi, it spread to Colossae, it spread all the way to to Rome. So the gospel spread. And then what you have is you have non-Jewish people who we call Gentiles. They're hearing the gospel. They receive the gospel and they become a part of this body called the church. Now all around in Israel and all around, you have two groups of people, Jewish and non-Jewish people from two different backgrounds, from two different cultures, with two different sets of values, with two different sets of customs, with different worldviews. Uh, they're, they're, what, what they eat is different. What they wear is different. Everything is different about them, but yet they've had a shared experience in the gospel, and now they're a part of one body called the church. Now, for Paul and for and the other writers of the New Testament, and even for Jesus himself, it's, the question is, how are we going to get along? How are we going to relate to one another now? So what you'll find out is sprinkled all throughout the New Testament is these one another's. And there's probably a dozen or more one another's uh, of how we relate. Last week, we looked at love one another. We actually started with Jesus and him talking to his disciples and telling them the importance of loving one another. And then we went through the New Testament and showed the different places where love one another uh, is shown. And we said on love one another is that Jesus kind of flipped the script because back in the law, the command was to love your neighbor as you love yourself, as you love yourself. So if I love myself good, I don't even know I love my neighbor good. If I don't love myself good, I may not love my neighbor good. So my love for others was based upon my ability to to love. But Jesus said, a new commandment I'm going to give to you is that you love one another as I have loved you. And when we let Jesus define love, when we let Jesus be the example, and when we let Jesus who lives in us love through us, then it will give us a greater experience of how we can love one another. So I hope your prayer this week was what we talked about. Father, love people through me, not by my love, but by your love. Well, today we're going to look at another one another. And the one another we're going to look at today is, wait for it, forgive one another. And everybody said, uh... (laughs) I can feel the excitement in the room when you talk about forgive one another because everybody wants to come and hear a sermon about how we need to forgive one another. But that's what we're going to talk about today because forgiveness is the way to freedom. Somebody say forgiveness is the way to freedom. Forgiveness is the way to freedom. If you want to live in unforgiveness, you can continue to live bound up. If you want to live free, the first step in that is forgiveness. It is a powerful, powerful principle. It's powerful, first of all, because everybody in the world needs forgiveness. You needed forgiveness. I need forgiveness uh, from God. We all need forgiveness because we've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Therefore, we needed God's forgiveness. You know, and being relational people, we don't always relate to one another well. So there's probably been times that you've needed to forgive somebody that's hurt you. And then there may have been times that you've needed to be forgiven for something that you have done to somebody else. We've all been in that scenario. So we're going to look at what the New Testament today has to say about forgiving one another. We're going to begin in the book of Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, if you have your Bibles or your phones, you can can pull up Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 12 through 14 today, Colossians 3, 12 through 14. And there's a parallel chapter in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 is kind of a parallel chapter. We'll look at Ephesians chapter 4 in a few moments. But we're going to begin in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Again, Colossians is one of those uh, towns, Colossae, where you have a church where there's Jews and Gentiles. And how are we going to treat one another? How are we going to get along with one another? And here's what the Apostle Paul says 
to the church at Colossae. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. I, I, side note, side note, I just love how Paul defines these believers. Now, he's going to instruct them on a lot of things. They were not perfect people. They didn't have everything together. He's going to give them a lot of instructions, but he begins with identity. Before instructions come identity. Before he tells you what to do, he tells you who you are. Everything flows out of identity. So how does he identify these believers at Colossae? As God's chosen people. Even in the mess you're in, God's chosen people. Even imperfectly, God's chosen people. Even when you mess up, you are God's chosen people. Even when you're not as faithful as you should be, he, Paul defined them as God's chosen people. And then he called them holy and dearly loved. Holy and dearly loved. So he says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. He says, as God's people, this is how we're supposed to, this is what's supposed to flow from our lives. Humility, compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience. And then he says, bear with each other. Bear with each other, strive with each other, tolerate with each other, put up with each other, bear with each other, and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, he's telling you how to relate as God's people as who you are in Christ, as God's chosen people, as holy people, as people dearly loved. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, then he says this, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Remember our principle last week, as you have been loved by God, now you can love. It's not if you love, then God will love you. It's God loved you first, and now you can love others the way Christ loved you. It's the same way with forgiveness. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's the same way with forgiveness. Now, Christian, now that you've been forgiven by God, you can now forgive others. You've been freely forgiven, fully forgiven. Now, the same forgiveness you've been extended, you can use that to forgive others. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Then he says in verse 14, and over all these virtues... Put on love. If you remember last week, I said that all the other one another's were tied back to love. And here's the first example of this. Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So if you want unity, if you want unity in a church, if you want unity in your household, if you want unity in your marriages, if you want unity as a parent, if you want unity in your jobs, if you want unity in all of your relationships, this is a good place to go. This is a good place to go that tells us the way to unity. And we could spend a lot of time breaking this verse down, bringing these verses down, talking about all this stuff, but I want to focus on one thing today, and that is your highlighted words, forgive one another and forgive as the Lord forgave you. I love what the Passion Translation says. It says, forgiving one another in the same way that you have been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. As you've been graciously forgiven, forgive one another. If you find fault with someone, or I love how this reads, release the same gift of forgiveness to them. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness at the cross is a gift. Everything in Jesus is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Righteousness is a gift. Forgiveness is a gift that is freely offered to everybody because forgiveness was done at the cross. And it's a gift that's offered to everybody to receive that gift of forgiveness and experience and live in the forgiveness and the goodness of God. But how many of you know when it comes to forgiveness, the easiest thing to do is talk about it? The easy part was for me to read those verses, right? That's the easy part in forgiveness. The easiest part to do is to tell somebody, you, need, you just need to forgive that person, you know? You just need to forgive them. Sometimes it's easy just to tell our minds, you know, we just need to forgive that person. 
But how does that work? Because where, where there is forgiveness needed, obviously there's something behind that forgiveness. There's a, a hurt. There is a, a fault. There is a betrayal of trust. There's a breaking of relationships. There's maybe hard work needed at restoration that may, you may feel like doing or not feel like doing. It involves injury and offense. All of these things are behind the need to forgive. And there are many ideas and beliefs about forgiveness. And some of these feelings about forgiveness, some of these ideas about forgiveness and, and long-held beliefs about forgiveness can actually hinder us from fully and freely forgiving. Now, I want to talk about a couple of these today. All right, have you ever heard the term forgive and forget? Forgive and forget. I, we've all probably tried to forgive and forget. And sometimes we think the forgiving part, hey, you know, we can do that. But the forgetting part, you know, that's a little more difficult. And sometimes we feel if we don't forget, then it cancels out our forgiveness. So one question would be, and I've had people ask before, if, if I can't forget it, does that mean I haven't forgiven that person? So they're afraid and they live in guilt that maybe they haven't forgiven if they haven't forgotten, because we hear that all the time, forgive and forget. We'll talk about it. Secondly, what about negative feelings? Because if somebody does something to us and there's hurt there, we carry around some of those feelings. You know, and, and they, may, they may be good and they may flare back up. You know, we may be good for a while and then it may flare back up. We have these feelings. And some people feel, you know, well, if I still have these feelings, maybe that means I haven't forgiven somebody. And they still live with the guilt of maybe not freely forgiven, maybe not fully forgiven if they still have these negative feelings. How do we deal with it? We'll talk about it. Or there's some attitudes about forgiveness, you know. Or how about well, I'm not going to forgive them until they ask for it. If they want my forgiveness, they need to come and ask for my forgiveness. You know, we have that attitude in the world. And what that does is that keeps us in unforgiveness. Or how about this one? And we'll talk about this. If I haven't perfectly forgiven everybody else, does that mean God will not forgive me? There's people walking around saying, well, if I don't forgive others, then God's going to turn that on me. We'll talk about it. Or maybe somebody, maybe the issue is we haven't fully forgiven ourselves for things that we've done in the past, and we, we live with guilt, and we live with, with shame and, and unworthiness because I can never truly forgive myself. Or, or what about I shouldn't have to forgive, you know? They deserve. They deserve my anger toward them. They deserve that, and we seek retribution more than we seek reconciliation. Or how about if I forgive, then that may be me condoning their actions. And if I forgive them, they'll just, they might get away with it scot-free, and, and we can't, I can't be condoning it, and, and they need to suffer the consequences. So if I forgive, I feel like I'm condoning what the person gives. Or what about I can't forgive because I still don't trust them? We don't think we can forgive until we can trust the person. So you can see how deep this issue of forgiveness can go. And, and you can see why there are people that work through these issues of forgiveness for many, many years in their life because there's many deep-seated beliefs uh, many deep-seated ideas, many feelings behind the issue of forgiveness. Well, what we want to do today is we want to, to look at this issue of forgiveness through the gospel. Because that's what we do here. We look at everything through the gospel. And forgiveness, again, it's easy to read it. It's another thing to put it into practice. Because as C.S. Lewis says, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something to forgive. So when all the pains of life come to us, the heartbreak, the injury, maybe the abandonment, the betrayal, the offense, here's what we must understand. Every hurt is personal, and hurts cut deep. But forgiveness is the way to freedom. Somebody say, forgiveness is the way to freedom. Because how many of you know, just get over it doesn't work a lot of times. Just get over it. You know, why don't you just forgive? Why don't you just get over it? Easier said than done. Because if we're not careful, our hurt will end up turning on us. 
and the other person hurt us, and that hurts, but when your hurt turns on yourself, and now you, and now you are living with your own self-condemnation. When you're living with your own self-doubt, when you're living with your own self-criticism, it turns on you, and now unforgiveness becomes something you are harboring that ends up harming you. So we want to talk about it today. So there's three truths that I want to bring to focus today to bring us back to the gospel, to bring us back to the gospel. Number one, the first truth that I want us to see is that forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. There was an instance in Matthew chapter 18 where Peter comes up to Jesus. And Peter says, and he's actually probably looking for a, you know, Jesus to commend him. And he says, Peter came to him and he says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Should I forgive seven times somebody that forgives me? Now, in rabbinic Jewish thought, you won't really find this in, in the, the law or the Old Testament, but in Jesus' time, the, uh, the, the rabbis and the Jewish teachers, they, they had a lot of their own interpretations. They had a lot of their own traditions. They had a lot of their own teachings and doctrines. And, and one of the teachings of rabbinical Judaism in Jesus' day is that you were obligated to forgive somebody up to three times. Three times, you can forgive somebody. Fourth time, well then, there ain't nothing you can do. You know, fool me once, shame on me. Fool, can't get fooled again. You know, you know that stuff. You know, for, I'll forgive you once, I'll forgive you twice, I'll forgive you three times, but if you do it again, you're the problem. And I'm not obligated to forgive you again. So Peter, being virtuous, Peter being spiritual, says, how many times should we forgive Jesus? Seven times? thinking maybe that would impress Jesus. Seven times, not three. Three's the bare minimum. What if we did seven? Jesus replied to him, and he says, no, Peter, not seven times. Seventy times seven. Seventy times seven. There's a lot of sevens in there, and seven is the number for completion or, or perfection. And what Jesus is saying is not 490 times in the 491st time. Jesus is saying an infinite amount of times. As many times as they sin against you should be the times that you forgive because forgiveness isn't based on worthiness in the gospel. Forgiveness isn't based on whether you deserve forgiveness. Forgiveness is based on grace. In the gospel, forgiveness is based on grace. Forgiveness doesn't determine if you're worthy. Forgiveness, by God's definition, says I'm going to the unworthy to forgive them. I'm going to the undeserving to forgive them. I'm going to the people that, that are unrepentant, and I'm going to them and offering forgiveness to them. That's what forgiveness by grace does. So in Ephesians chapter 1, I love this verse of Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verse number 7, it says this, In Christ, in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, listen, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You and I are forgiven according to God's grace. You're not forgiven according to anything about you. You're not forgiving because you're a good person. You're not forgiven because you deserve it. You're not forgiven because you earn it. You're not forgiven because you're religious. You're not forgiven because you, you, know, you help little old ladies carry their groceries to their car. You, know, you, you don't get forgiveness for any of those things that you do because forgiveness is, you're not even forgiven in accordance with how many times you ask for forgiveness. You're forgiven according to God's grace. God's grace determines your level of forgiveness in accordance to God's grace. And then if that wasn't enough, if you read the next verse in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8, it adds this. Forgiven of your sins in accordance to the riches of God's grace, which he lavished upon us. 
which he lavished upon us. How rich is God's grace? God is filthy rich in grace. And he has lavished all of the riches of his grace onto your life. In spite of everything you've done, all of your mess ups, all your mistakes, all of the hurt you've caused, all the hurt that was caused to you, everything you regret, everything you're guilty for, God's grace has been lavished upon you. And God has forgiven it and wiped your slate clean. That is the riches of God's grace. He's filthy rich in grace, and he lavished it upon you. Forgiveness is by grace. Forgiveness is by grace. But what about this? Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is by grace, number one. Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. But what about feeling? What about feeling? Because as we said, behind every need of forgiveness, there's hurt and wounds. And there's feelings and emotions behind all of those things. Can I say that I forgive somebody without the feeling of forgiveness? Can I say that I forgive somebody if I don't forget? Can I say I forgive somebody if, you know, if I still haven't gotten over what they've done. You say forgiveness is a choice, but if I still feel something, does that mean I haven't forgiven them? Here's something I like to say. I like to use the phrase, we forgive by faith. We forgive by faith. And forgiving by faith happens in an instant. Forgiven by faith happens with one decision. When you say, as a believer, you know that you're supposed to forgive. And as a believer, you may want to forgive, but you can't get past your feelings. Since when did our feelings determine how we live our lives? They don't. If we're living by feelings, a lot of time we're not living by faith. So we're not waiting for our feelings to validate our choice to forgive. I'm going to forgive in spite of my feelings. I'm going to forgive regardless of what I feel on the inside. It's not hypocritical to rise above your emotions and act in a way that's consistent with the character of God. It's not hypocritical at all. So here's what I like to say. Faith forgiveness is instantaneous. Feeling forgiveness is a process. Faith forgiveness is instantaneous. You can forgive somebody and say, God, you know I'm hurt. You know my emotions. You know my feelings. You know what I'm going through. God, I don't want to feel this way, but God, I forgive that person. That's forgiveness by faith. That's you acting in a way that's consistent with who you are in Christ. It's a choice. Then you can say, now God, help me with my feelings. Help me in this process that where I say forgive them, but then I see them and and the feelings start to come. That's where the Holy Spirit will work on you. Faith forgiveness is instantaneous. Feeling forgiveness, getting over those feelings of hurt is a process. And one thing I tell people, one thing I've had to practice in my own life is to practice verbally hearing yourself Say, I forgive that person for this. Again, you may have the feelings. It has nothing to do with the feelings. Verbally out loud, at your home, in your car, in that prayer time, say, Father, I forgive so-and-so for this. That way you are hearing with your, your own ears, your own mouth, speak words of forgiveness. And hearing yourself speak words of forgiveness will start that process of those feelings going away, those feelings subsiding. So verbally hear yourself say, I forgive you even if your feelings don't match your words. And if you do this enough, your feelings will catch up to your faith. Your feelings will catch up to your faith. So forgiveness is a choice. It is by grace. It's not dependent upon if the other person deserves it. It's dependent upon you making the choice. And another thing, you know, go ahead and make the choice to forgive before the offense even comes. Go ahead and tell yourself, you know, when somebody offends me, forgiveness is my default. I've already made the choice, even before I'm hurt, before my feelings get involved, that I'm going to forgive. 
So therefore, you've already made the choice to forgive even before it happens. Number two, forgiveness is our new nature. Forgiveness is our new nature. God forgives because he is a forgiving God. It's his nature. He's a loving, forgiving Heavenly Father, and it's his nature to forgive. And we are most like our Heavenly Father when we forgive others. So what's our motivation for forgiving? Twofold. First of all, it's because of love. It's because of love. Because God loved us, we love others. And in Colossians chapter 3, remember that? Above all these virtues, love one another. And then number two, our motivation for forgiving is because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Because God has forgiven us, we now forgive others. Just as God has loved us, therefore we love others. Just as God has forgiven us, therefore we forgive others. Others. It's the nature of our loving God to forgive, and He's forgiven you. So therefore, we forgive. It's our new, despite what you feel, again, it's not about your feelings, despite what you feel, it's your new nature to forgive. E- even if you have a hard time forgiving, a hard time getting over it, you should at least have a want to. I, you know, I want to forgive that person. I just, we say, this, I want to forgive them, I just can't. I want to get over it, I just can't. Well, the want to is, is a good place to start, because the want to shows that you're living out of your new nature. You just have to overcome that flesh with faith, because that's our new nature. So if you notice, if you go up to the very beginning of chapter 3 of Colossians, Paul always addresses behavior on the basis of identity. If you remember that, remember our passage, how did he start out? As children of God, holy and dearly loved. He appealed to identity before behavior. He appealed to identity before behavior. If you went all the way back up to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, since you have been raised with Christ, set your mind on things above. Your position is you've been raised with Christ. Now, this is how you live from that. And he says down a, a little bit more in verse number 9, he says, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on your new self, renewed in knowledge after God, So the whole basis of forgiveness is based on our new nature. It's now our nature to forgive others freely, by grace, even if they don't deserve it. Ephesians chapter 4, you can go back and read Ephesians chapter 4. It's kind of a parallel passage to Colossians chapter 3. Listen to what Ephesians 4.32 says. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God in Christ forgave you. So again, the same principle. Forgive others in the same way God in Christ has forgiven you. And then if you read up in Ephesians 4, it says to put off the old man and to put on your new self, created just like God. It appeals on the basis of our identity. It is now our identity, our new nature. And part of our new nature is that we've been forgiven by God. And I want to address this very quickly. We've been forgiven by God. I've said several times in the message that because God has forgiven us, therefore we forgive others. And this gets confused sometimes with something Jesus says that seems to say the exact opposite of what Ephesians and Colossians says. Because Ephesians and Colossians says this, to forgive one another just as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you has forgiven you. We read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. He forgave us all our sin. That's a past tense word. It's past tense in Colossians 3, 13. Just as God has forgiven you. It's past tense in Ephesians chapter 4. Be kind, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, when he's writing to his little children. He says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Forgiveness is on account of his name. 
It's in accordance with the riches of his grace, and it's done at Calvary. So the New Testament is very, very clear. The epistles are very, very clear. Post-Calvary, very, very clear on our standing of forgiveness. Forgive as you have been forgiven. But Jesus says something that if we take face value what Jesus says, it should scare all of us. It should concern all of us. Because Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, which he's talking to Jews, living under the law, basically to, to give them the perfect ideal of a Jewish person living under the law, in order to eventually show them they can't live under the law, here's what Jesus says. Jesus says to forgive each other because if you don't forgive, then God will not forgive you. Wait a minute. All right? So Jesus says, if you don't forgive everybody else, then God will not forgive you. So that means my forgiveness from God is dependent upon how I forgive others. That means my forgiveness is up to me. Now, we've talked about the gospel long enough in the past few years to know that that doesn't sound like the gospel. The gospel says, no, you've been freely forgiven by God, no strings attached. Now you can go out and forgive others. So what are we dealing with here? Well, it's exactly what we said. You know, Jesus also said some other stuff that I don't see us. You know, Jesus says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. How many of you looked at, you don't have to raise your hands. How many of you looked at something this week you shouldn't have looked at? How many of you said something this week you shouldn't have said? Did you cut your tongue out? Did you cut your eye out? Jesus said, if, if, your, if your right hand offends you, chop it off. How many of you chopped off your hand this week? Nobody. Nobody plucked your eye out. Nobody chopped your hand off. You didn't cut your foot off. You didn't cut your tongue off, you know. Some of us are scatterbrained. We didn't cut our, you know, we just. So there's some things Jesus says that's spoken in a context to a specific people. So Jesus, as a Jewish person, comes to the Jewish people, because Jesus himself said, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus, as a Jewish person, comes to the Jewish people, living under the law, basically to show them, you can't keep the law. And plus, the Sermon on the Mount, is, it goes against the Pharisees. So what is Jesus saying? Well, he's speaking of, even to the Jewish people living under the law, the importance of forgiveness. And listen, forgiveness is no less important under the new covenant than it is under the old covenant. But if the standard, again, is up to us, remember Jesus said, you know, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Our love is imperfect. Try to do that. If you don't forgive others, then God won't forgive you. Classic law. Classic law. But then we come to the other side of the cross. And when you come to the other side of the cross, it's not if you, then God. Remember we talked about last week, it's not if then, it's since therefore. It's not if you forgive others, then God will forgive you. It's since you've been forgiven, therefore now you can forgive others. You see, it's very important. You can't just read the Bible, you got to read the Bible. You got to know what it's talking about because that brings so much confusion into people's lives when you have two statements that are very contradictory. So you have to put it in its proper place. So for the believers, we forgive out of our new nature that was secured at Calvary on the cross, which says, now that God has forgiven you, you are forgiven by God. Now you can forgive others. And then finally, number three, forgiveness is for our healing. Forgiveness is for our healing. I mentioned earlier that unforgiveness, if left unchecked, can turn on you and hurt you more than the other person that hurts you in the beginning. If you hold on to unforgiveness, you're only hurting yourself more. Unforgiveness becomes a root of bitterness on the inside. And if a root of bitterness springs up, it can cause a lot of of damage. So to recognize these bitter roots, how do we recognize bitter roots? Well, ask yourselves, am I all the time replaying that hurt that person did in my mind? Are the tapes always on repeat? Are they always looping in my mind? Can I not get it out of my mind? You know, if that thing can't get out of your mind, that, that, that's a sign of unhealthiness. Is my mouth out of control? Can I not stop talking about what that person did to me? Can I not stop talking? Stop talking. If you can't stop talking about it, it shows that that unforgiveness is turned back on you and it's doing you harm, more harm than maybe even the original offense did. 
Is unforgiveness affecting my health? You know, I've never seen a person living in bitterness and unforgiveness that was a happy, healthy person. I've seen people living in unforgiveness and bitterness that were miserable and depressed and, and sick, but never happy and healthy and, and whole. Is unforgiveness affecting my health? If it is, that's a sign that unforgiveness is turned on you. And you need to forgive, not for that person. You need to forgive for your sake. What about, am I turning to other things in temporary relief? Because I don't want to address this issue head on. Am I supplementing that, doing all these other things in my life? Some can be good, some can be harmful to you. What about, is my bitterness making my circle bitter? Am I affecting those around me? Hurt people hurt people. That's a sign that healing is needed, and the way to for freedom is forgiveness. So why should we forgive? We should forgive those who hurt because it will set you free from the bondage of that hurt. You don't want to live in a prison cell while the offending party is walking free. You want to be the one living in freedom. You want to be the one living whole in your life. To forgive those who hurt you will allow you to get on with your life in a healthy way. It'll help you to move forward. It'll help you to move as part of the healing process, moving forward. Most importantly, to forgive those who hurt you will allow you to act in a way that's consistent with who you truly are. You will, you will be the person you are called to be. You will do what God has called you to do. When you forgive, it brings wholeness in your life. You don't want that forgiveness to turn, that unforgiveness to turn upon you and attack and hurt you even more. Forgiveness is the way to freedom. So as we pray today, there's some specific things that I want to pray. I want to pray that our hearts will be healed from all hurt and bitterness from all pain, everything has been spoken to us, everything has been done to us, that our hearts will experience healing today from our healer Jesus. I want to pray that we'll experience the peace and joy that comes with knowing you're forgiven and forgiving others, that we can be happy and healthy because we're forgivers, that we'll see a greater measure of wholeness in every area of our lives, and that unforgiveness will not hold us back from being who God has called us to be. And we can walk in everything God has said that we could walk in, the abundant life for Him. So let's pray together this time. Let's stand to our feet if we can. And